This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of Mac's List. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Ben Forstang, Becky Thomas, and Jessica Black from the Mac's List team. This week, we're talking about why you need a career manifesto. wants work that offers purpose and meaning. Our guest expert this week is career coach Maggie Mistel. She says that writing a career manifesto is one of the best ways to find a job you can love. Maggie and I talk later in the show. The economy creates new occupations every year. How do you prepare for a job that doesn't exist yet? Ben has found a website with a list of eight careers that one consultant predicts you can have by 2025. Ben tells us more in a moment. What's the best way to return to a full-time office job after you've worked at home as a freelancer for more than a decade? That's our listener question of the week. It comes from Heather Fonseca of Los Angeles. Becky shares her advice shortly. But first, as always, let's check in with the Maxilis team. This week, we're talking about career manifestos. Have, uh, have any of you done a written declaration like this before? And if not, have you done something similar? And, and, and whatever you've done, how has it helped you? Ben, you're leaning into the uh, microphone. Yeah, I've you're never done a... First uh, out of the gate. I've never written a manifesto for anything, let alone my career. But uh, I have, for work projects, like always tried to set a deadline for things like and publicly state like here's when we're going to launch this new website or here's when this new thing is going to come out um, because there's nothing like setting a date and putting it on the calendar and telling people it's coming to like really light a fire under your butt and make sure it happens um, otherwise you end up thinking or saying like oh I'm going to do this someday and that day never arrives yeah you know and what do you think is most effective there is it writing it down with a specific date or is it telling people that you're Sharing that date with others. I think it's telling people and uh, putting yourself at risk of public shame if it does if you can't deliver on what you've said you're going to do. I saw you nodding there, Jessica. What are your thoughts? Oh, um, not related to that necessarily, but you guys know I'm a planner. You are a planner. Yeah, um, but I'm also a <laughs> plan breaker. Um, at least my own plans. I like to make a lot of plans, but use them as guidelines or um, things to sort of just be be goals. So I, I write things out and kind of make a plan of like this and this and this, and I can do this on, you know, in terms of like when I went to school, I could be like, I'm going to go to school in this term and I'm going to take these classes. And then after that, I'll do this and then da da da. But then I'll have like, a couple simultaneous plans for the various options that I have. So I'm not locked into, I don't like to be locked into Are things. Like, like plan B's and plan C's sort of thing? Like, no, it's uh, just like a bunch paths? of different options. Yeah, a bunch of different paths. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, so I don't, like I said, I don't like to be locked into things, but I like to have kind of, I, I like to look ahead to what can come from various situations and scenarios. So uh, I don't know if that's exactly what Maggie is going to talk about with her career manifesto, Um, because I'm not exactly sure what a career manifesto is. But in terms of the the planning, planning your sort of life goals, I do that. I definitely do that. Yeah, I I think she's going to. There is a difference, uh, Mm -hmm. but it's related to what you just described. I'm I'm curious, uh, Jessica, how does the writing it down help you? What what is the benefit of that? What how does that help you accomplish your goals? Uh, yeah, I think kind of what Ben was saying, it just makes it more real. When you kind of pull it out of your head and write it down, it, it sort of beco- it, it forms it more into an actual plan rather than just sort of a dream or a wish that it kind of just floats around in your head. And so I think that that really helps and you can um, figure out the tangible steps to make it happen once it's written down, at least for me. Okay, and I got to ask, because yeah. you mentioned it, you said you were a plan breaker too. So when do you break the plan? When I find a different plan that I want to do instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, great. How about you, Becky? I'm- well, 
That's interesting because I feel like the the I looked up the definition of manifesto, uh-huh. and it's a written statement declaring publicly yeah. the intentions, motives, or views of its issu- issuer. Mm-hmm. And it feels like it's really like a manifesto is very like setting in stone your beliefs and your aims and your goals. And I don't feel like I approach my career that way. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say too. Is that be, I have like never, you want to be flexible. Well, and I've never had. I've talked about this on the podcast too. Is I've never had a clear, direct. And career goal. So, <laughs> so I feel like had I had something like, you know, I want to be a lawyer, and then I would, ha- I could be able to make a career manifesto, mm-hmm. giving me this clear path and the st- all the steps to get me there, but not having that clear end goal for a long time, and kind of, f- and that was where I, I was keeping my options open and having multiple plans because I had. I've talked about this before, too many interests and couldn't decide which which sort of path to take. And mm-hmm. so I um, I felt like I needed to have a couple of different plans for various whatever options mm-hmm. came along. Yeah. So and I feel like that's uh that's the approach that feels more modern mm-hmm. than having a job title goal mm-hmm. at the end of your career sort of thing. Right. Um so I'm interested to hear what Maggie has to say about that because I feel like if I were to like give you my career manifesto, it wouldn't be about what job I had. It would be about what my what I'm contributing, what my core skills are, and, yeah. and I can apply those in a, many different job titles. You know, yeah, so, I, or ideal sort of what your life would look like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's an interesting topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward it. to the conversation. Yeah. I've done the, this kind of planning too that Jessica, that you and Ben described. Uh, you know, the, a, a big. I went through a very extensive process when I was getting ready for graduate school in my early 30s, and and I did map out what I wanted to do for the next five to ten years. And I think I've shared this on the show before, too. The first day of of school, um, uh, it was Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. They sat us all down, and they had us in 30 minutes go through a form where we had to say what our goals were for the next six months, 12 months, 18, 24, five years, 10 years, and... um, 30 years. And Mm -hmm. people, you got actually a carbon copy of this. And people have, I I see classmates at reunions and people still refer back to them. So, you know, it's the kind of program that attracts planning nerds. Yeah. Uh, I was one of them. Uh, And it's a useful skill. But I think to Becky's point, and you made this as well, Jessica, it's not about chasing job titles anymore. It's about figuring out what we want to do yeah. in our careers as well. Yeah, around. for fulfillment. Yeah. I'm curious, though, uh, do you still have that carbon copy of your— I do, yeah. Did you— Did you? <laughs> it's not here at the office. No, of course but not. But I know where it is at home. You yeah. should frame it. You should bring it to the office. I want to see it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you tell that up. story, you know? Like, I want to see the carbon copy. Yeah. Anyway. It, it exists. There's <laughs> yeah. a box of, of stuff yeah. from that period. Well, I'm impressed. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, well, good conversation, and I'm looking forward to the interview with Maggie. But first, Ben, let's turn to you because you're out there every week poking around the Internet looking for tools, books, websites— that our listeners can use in a job search and career. So what have you uncovered for our listeners this week, Ben? This week, I'm taking you all to the future. Mm-hmm. We, we need some music. The yeah. distant, yeah. distant, <laughs> distant future. Not so distant. I found a, a uh, article, this one comes from Fast Company, called Eight New Jobs People Will Have in 2025. So when I was putting this together, I started thinking. I was like, 2025, that seems so far into the future. And then I realized it is totally not. That it's is right like, around the corner. That's like eight years from now. And we are closer to 2025 than we were to 2000 or 2005 or even 2009. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these are jobs that uh, if you talk to people who are like futurist and trend spotters, and that's exactly who the author uh, interviewed, these are the jobs that these folks see as emerging in the future. And the reason I'm talking about this today is kind of much to the point that Becky and Jessica were making. Like sometimes we we think that your career goals mean a job title. And the truth of the matter is like you don't know what you want to be what you're going to want to be doing in five years, right? Or what kind of job title that you might want. You know, the job that you want might not even exist right now. Like Mm -hmm. new things are always emerging and you have to be flexible and open to these new opportunities. And so I just wanted to highlight three of the eight jobs that these folks said 
would be available in 2025 because I thought they were particularly interesting. So uh, the first one is a digital death manager, hmm. which has a pretty uh, gothic name. But basically, you know, the idea here is, uh, you know, we document everything we do on social media. So like from like the meaningful, I got married, uh, I had a kid, I moved to like the mundane, like my baseball team won, or look at the food I had for dinner tonight. (laughs) Um, And so a digital death manager is someone who could take all of this material that you've generated over the course of your life and then make a story out of it in order to shape your digital legacy. That's so cool. They're like weeding out all the mundane stuff that that you might not want your great, great grandkids to find out about you online. Um, Like the pictures of your feet. You know, that so you take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The pictures what of you pictures? at the Portland airport. Right, so when you feed pictures. Oh, right. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at the yeah. airport. Yeah, like, yeah. oh, I'm going to travel. Okay, I thought you meant just like no, documenting. No. Your feed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. So it, would it be like, would it be like they're, um, they're like curating the best stuff and like getting rid of the bad stuff that's out there on the internet? I, I think it's, it's basically like they're a scrapbooker for your digital life. Ooh. Yeah. Right, Ooh, okay. like they are taking fun. like the highlights and like the things that you found personally meaningful and compiling it into a mm-hmm. story for your, for your progeny. Cool. Um, the second one is an unschooling counselor, and I think you already kind of see this job emerging. So the idea here is that the traditional concept of education, namely a four-year liberal arts degree, uh, is really breaking down, and educational options are more ad hoc now. Um, and customize around each person's career. Uh, you see the emergence of like these alternative education schools. Yeah. Um, I know Portland has a couple. I know there's several in California as well. Yeah. Um, and so an unschooling counselor is someone who helps people navigate this increasingly diverse educational landscape of like, oh, if you're really interested in this kind of mishmash of things, you can go over here for this class and over there for that class and get a certification from these people here. Um, and they're kind of walking you through this very customized, personalized education experience. Yeah, that one's really not that far from happening, I think. I, I think there are folks who are probably doing that already, although yeah. they're not calling themselves unschooling counselors. Right. And then the final one, one that's kind of close to my heart, is uh, the urban shepherd. And the idea here is that uh, as cities get greener and you see more and more towns doing things like urban farming and composting and beekeeping, you're going to need a new class of urban farmers who take care of the infrastructure. You know, the people who are responsible for taking care of the bees or maintaining vertical gardens on the side of skyscrapers and things like that. That's cool. And this is like a unique skill from traditional farming. It's like urban farming. So there's another five that they list there. They're all really interesting, um, some of which I think we're probably closer to than others. But the big theme here, again, is that, you know, you don't know what the future holds. And so, you know, again, your dream job, even if you can't find it today, it might be right around the corner, right? Or a job that you think is just perfect for you could be there. So you have to keep your eyes open for trends and keep your options open as well. Um, If you're interested in this topic, like I am, Check it out on uh, fastcompany.com. Again, the article is Eight New Jobs People Have in 2025, and I will have the link in the show notes. Great. Great tips. Uh, I think about what the four of us are doing around the table today, podcasting. That was a job that didn't exist um, I mean, pod- 10 years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. Podcasts first started appearing in 04 and 05, but it wasn't until the last few years that the equipment and the technology made it affordable and accessible. And popular. Yeah. And yeah. and I can't remember what episode it was, but I believe I did a a um, a resource that was like jobs that used to exist 20 years ago oh, yeah. and don't exist anymore. Uh-huh. And the same idea, like uh, you can't be static in your career because if you get stuck in one thing, that job might go away. And yeah. I frankly I don't think anyone can really predict accurately what jobs are going to stay, which ones are going to emerge and which ones are going to go away. So yeah. you have to be flexible. You do. Well, Great advice, Ben. And if you have a suggestion for Ben for a resource that we should feature on the show, please write him. We'd love to share your idea. Ben's address is easy to remember. It's ben at maxlist.org. Now let's turn to you, our listeners, and Becky is here to answer one of your questions. Becky, what's in the MaxList mailbag this week? Um, This week's question came in on the listener line from Heather Fonseca of Los Angeles, California. Hi, my name is Heather Fonseca from Los Angeles. I'm a, and my question is, I am a freelance designer. I've been freelancing from home, working from home for um, over 10 years, mostly so that I could be home with my children and kind of work at the same time. I am now looking for full-time work, and I'm finding it pretty difficult. 
would love to know if you guys have any tips. Thanks. Okay, so um, this is a good question. I think it's a pretty common one. A lot of parents will take a break from work to raise their kids. And I think Heather has an advantage in that she's been continuing to work um, freelancing Mm -hmm. during that time, during that 10-year span where she was raising her kids. She was also able to do some work from home. And that means that you're still plugged into the industry. You've got fresh skills. um, You're still super marketable from that standpoint. You're not start starting from scratch and having to explain why you have absolutely no information on your resume in the past 10 years. So mm-hmm. I think that's a really big benefit that you need to um, utilize as much as you can. Um, and I think that the other thing is it's important to have a goal as you make this transition from working at home and freelancing and sort of working for yourself to working in a full-time office, more traditional sort of role. Um, So think about what kind of jobs you want to target. Um, If there are skills that you need to brush up on, um, think about what you want to prioritize there. Um, You know, taking on like professional education opportunities, like online classes, um, also like in-person seminars or like shorter term uh, education um, will get you really re-engaged and also help you meet people and like expand your network. Um, And then I'd also recommend like doing some research on the industries you'd like to work in. So you're in Los Angeles, you've you've got a big city to work with. So I would focus on like maybe the industries that you've worked in in the past and look at what companies might be growing, which organizations may be investing in design, which is where you're working. Um, Start following those organizations, um, whether it's on LinkedIn, on social, um, checking out their websites from time to time and see if you can get connected within those organizations that you want to target. So getting those informational interviews, getting connected, meeting people with, uh, within those companies will really help. And then also turning to your existing network from, from past experiences. So former coworkers, as well as I think the, the bigger one is your current freelance clients, like the people that know your work that's super recent. Um, just, you know, be honest and open with them about your goals and your transition and ask for advice and introductions and just like grow your network that way. I think that's going to help you a lot. And then use that foundation of connections once you're applying for jobs, apply at companies where you do have connections and you know that you can get someone to give you a recommendation. That's going to get you like such a stronger footing when you are applying and hopefully getting more interviews and job offers um, and you'll have more to choose from. So um, that's my advice for you, Heather. I think that you're definitely on the right track sort of thinking about this stuff and it is a big transition. So hopefully that helps. Do you guys have any other thoughts? Yeah. First of all, that was really comprehensive so I don't have a lot to add but um but I do think that Heather you uh can also translate your experience as being a working mom as well and showcase this sort of skills that you are trans transferring into the workplace in that way as well not only your design skills that you have and your you know experience in the work in your portfolio there, but also if you want to, it's, you know, that's wonderful if you want to stay in the design world, but if you wanted to pivot a little bit and use both your design background um, to sort of help you with the next step of whatever it is that you want. I think, Becky, what you said about identifying your goals Mm -hmm. and really sitting down and um, looking at what it is that you want and what skills you have existing that you can bring to that industry. And I do think that, you know, being a parent is a huge important job Mm -hmm. that is not to be discounted and that you can use a lot of those skills um, when you're, when you're applying and when you're talking about what you bring to the table, whether that's just um, project management or, um, you know, leadership skills, those types of things that you are guiding little humans. And so uh, I think that that can easily translate. Um, And then, of course, we say this all the time, and Becky, you mentioned this, and I think I just wanted to reiterate it because it's really important of, um, you know, using your connections and Mm -hmm. brushing brushing back into that world. And um, it'll help you both to you know, feel like you're getting back into that world, but then also help you to get into the, the, to the, to the job world. So I wonder if Heather is struggling here uh, 
because of this transition, specifically from being freelance into the full-time job. And I've seen this with other folks who are trying to make that same transition. In our culture, we have such a strong, um, you know, we almost mythologize like the entrepreneur or the person who works for themselves and the virtue of like being your own boss Mm -hmm. that I think a lot of people are skeptical of someone who wants to stop being their own boss and go work for someone else now. Um, I know I've had that thought whenever an application comes across my desk and I say like, well, this person's been freelancing for 10 years. Why all of a sudden do they want to work for me? Like what is it because, you know, they, they, weren't successful doing what they were doing or is there some other reason that they want to do this? Do they, would they really rather work for themselves and this is just the fallback for them and as soon as they can get their career back up and running, they'll, they'll leave. So I think this gets back to this one challenge I've talked about a lot in the show, which is like really explaining why you want the specific job with the employer and like yeah. creating a narrative around why, why you're making this choice. It's a conscious choice. It's something you want. It's not something you're falling into or mm-hmm. it's not your fallback position. Yeah. So, you know, if, if your goal is really a full-time work with a, someone else as an employee, you know, make it really clear why you want to do that, Heather. I think that's going to help you out. Yeah, that's and key. I think that's really important. Good I point. think that's a good point as well. Um, and in Heather's case, and who knows, this is just my assumption, I would assume that she was freelancing because she was parenting yeah, that's what at, it sounds at, like. this, at yeah. the same time. And so it makes it makes life easier. But I do think that bringing that up up front and being really transparent about that is really important. Yeah, I think providing a story, an explanation, is is just going to address that doubt that yeah. might go unexpressed in the mind of a of a hiring manager. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad you brought that up, and and you, Jessica and, and Becky, you both emphasize the importance of reaching out to your network. And I think sometimes people are reluctant to do that because they think others don't want to help. And my experience has been uh, both as a job seeker and talking to other job seekers, people want to help. They just you got to make it easy for them to say yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. great, great advice. And Heather, let us know how it goes because um, yeah. uh, we do uh, meet other people like you who are making this transition, and we'd love to learn what works best for you. Well, great. Well, thanks, Becky, um, yeah. and thank you, Heather. If you've got a question for Becky, uh, please send her an email. Her address is becky at maxlist.org. Or you can call our listener line like Heather did. That number is area code 716-JOB-TALK. Or send us a message on Facebook. You can find Max List on Facebook. If we use your question on the show, we'll send you a copy of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. And we'll be back in a moment. When we return, I'll talk with this week's guest expert, Maggie Mistel, about why you need a career manifesto. Now let's turn to this week's guest expert, Maggie Mistel. Maggie Mistel has helped thousands of people find their ideal careers. She also helps leading corporations with employee development. Maggie has her own podcast called Making a Living, and previously she hosted career advice shows for Sirius XM and Martha Stewart Living Radio. Her insights have also been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other national publications. She joins us today from Pennsylvania. Maggie, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure, Mac. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Now, our topic this week, Maggie, is career manifestos. And we had a spirited discussion uh, about career manifestos before you joined us. We're just talking about our own career planning as uh, my hosts and I. Uh, And what would you say to our listeners about a career manifesto? What, What is it exactly? Well, so many folks, Mac, are letting the job market determine their careers, right? You know, they feel they have to shoehorn into what's out there. They feel limited, too, in terms of choices. If they can't find a job that works for them, again, they have to kind of sacrifice, right, or dial back their expectations. And what a career manifesto does is the complete opposite. It gives you an opportunity to control your own career destiny because you define the direction you want to go in, the opportunities that work for you really the ideal scenario from a work standpoint that utilizes your genius, you know, your unique talents and your abilities. So this manifesto is your perspective on how you want to be of service to the world through your work. Well, Maggie, how is that different from setting career goals and making a list, for example, of of what you want to accomplish professionally and and describing the, the jobs you might want? Sure. Well, it's larger than that, Mac, because 
it includes your life purpose, right? It's got this, you know, bigger, more strategic aspect to it than a goal. A goal could be, I want to have my dream job. That's great. What a manifesto does though, is it talks specifically about what your life purpose is. You know, what, what do you want your life to stand for? And it's putting that stake in the ground to say, well, here's what I stand for. Here's therefore the work I want to do and who I want to help and how I want to help them and what skills I want to utilize. And frankly, which ones I don't. Because when, uh, what unfortunately happens to a lot of folks is that they get co-opted in to doing and taking on responsibilities that they really don't want to be doing, right? But then that becomes the resume. And then that becomes the jobs that they do. And that becomes the next job. You know, it, it just kind of spirals away from them. And this manifesto was bringing it back to where you as an individual, where and how you want to work. And it's actually very helpful because a lot of people, when they're not doing work they love, are pretty unhappy and aren't quite as productive as they could be. And this manifesto is a way for you to be strategic in terms of which employers you go after, which industries really work for you. You know, those places and those situations where you're excited to go to work every day, where it feels like a hobby you happen to get paid to do and you're just ecstatic. You know, that's the idea of a manifesto. It's beyond you know, that next job. And it's really a career strategy. I, I can imagine our listeners saying that sounds wonderful. I, I'd love to have that uh, be, uh, because uh, I have taken jobs that I, I needed to uh, have to pay my bills. But can you really make that happen? Can you give us an example, um, Maggie, of someone you've worked with who has used a career manifesto uh, and, and the difference it made in, in their work and, and their professional life? Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because the universe usually responds and supports us. And uh, just today I was speaking with a client who is a young woman who's had a lot of amazing internship experiences. And she's looking to turn those into her first career out of college. And so, again, this manifesto can happen at any stage of your life. And in her case, she was able to, we were able to define the ideal scenarios that would really work for her career-wise, based on her interests, based on her talents. We, we use soul search techniques like um, asking about where she, you know, moments in her career when she experienced ecstatic engagement and loved what she was doing. We also asked her about who she admires and why, so we could get to those qualities she really wanted to put forth in her career. And we crafted you know, an ideal day in the life when she was loving what she was doing and how that fit her larger purpose of wanting to empower people, um, you know, and, and help them live better lives and what specifically she meant by that. And interestingly enough, that was her perspective. That was the start of her manifesto. And how it played out in real life is that she was interviewing for different opportunities. And a particular company really wanted her to work for them. <laughs> and she had some qualms about the job and she was expressing them you know, saying, well, this doesn't quite match these aspects of what I really want to do. And they said, that's okay. Give it a try anyway. And she said, okay. And she tried it for a week and she realized it's not what I wanted. Just, you know, and unfortunately, you know, her, her qualms came to fruition and she was able to easily though, and politely say, Hey, this didn't work out like I thought it would, like you thought it would, you know, we kind of talked about this as a possibility and everybody could leave feeling good about the situation. So she was able to leave a job within a week with great feelings on both sides. Now, a lot of people could not share that same experience after leaving a job within a week. <laughs> I know, yeah. But in this case, because she had her manifesto so clear, it was easy for her to see where there was a fit and where there wasn't. And I'm happy to report that very same person just today got a call for the very kind of job she wants to do. And so in her case, and in everybody's case, you can actually hold out, right, for the right opportunity. It's easier to trust that you're going to get there because all along the way you're expressing this to other people. You're letting them know, here's what I'm looking for. If you see anything like this, let me know. And then you have this whole group of people out there, growing group that almost are recruiters for you. And that's how this ideal opportunity actually has come across her plate. So she didn't have to take the job that didn't fit and feel uncomfortable and force herself into a, a job she didn't want to do. She was able to trust herself, trust the situation, trust the network that she has to deliver, and they have. And that, that's an interesting story. As you were telling it, uh, Maggie, I was reminded of, of a couple of times in my career as an employer when I've been approached by people who've responded to job postings I've had, and they're a month or two into another job. 
and they uh, and that fact typically would only come up after they um, were selected for an interview because normally you know as an employer I wouldn't talk to anyone who'd worked for someone else for less than a year and you could tell they were unhappy uh, but it just they they felt a little trapped and it's hard to leave a situation like that and persuade someone else to take a, a chance on you when you're talking to somebody uh, after you've accepted an opportunity somewhere else and you're thinking, well, gosh, if they can't be clear about what they want, how am I going to be certain they're going to be clear about wanting to be here? So That's right. Yeah. And that soul search step is so critical to just helping the individual get clear on what they want. And I think that is the the, the biggest opportunity for most people because they just haven't taken that kind of time in their lives or careers. And that's not for lack of wanting to, but it's there, there really are certain questions you want to ask yourself. There really are certain exercises you want to go through, certain big thinking kinds of opportunities that, you know, when you soul search, you don't think about any particular job. You really think about, you know, your, the life recording. The, I always tell my clients, you know, you're in Maggie's world now and anything is possible and you really need to, you know, dream big and say, what would my ideal look like? And what would it sound like? And what would I be even wearing? And what are, what are we talking about if I'm working in an office or am I working at home? What are the activities I'm working on? A lot of people have that in their minds and in their hearts. And so that soul search really pulls that out of them. And then the second step that they want to take is research because you can have an ideal vision for what you want, right? You can soul search into it, but then you want to make sure you want to look before you job search. You want to look before you leap. And a lot of people, I, you know, I have to caution them because they'll say, okay, great, I figured this out and I'm going to go get this job. And I'm like, whoa, do you know that job matches your vision? You know, you got to research first. And, and that's where informational interviews and, and that kind of good information comes into play so that people like the, this client in particular had done an amazing job at, I mean, informational interviews, I mean, consistently and constantly. And that's how she knew this job might not be a good fit. Uh, because she wasn't afraid to really ask the detailed questions about what a day in the life is like. You know, so you can't go in blindly and just hope it works. You've got to know it's going to be the right job for you and fit your manifesto. You know, and only once you've confirmed that do you want to do your job search and say, okay, you know, recruiting and hiring manager, here's my application. Here's why I'm a good fit. You know, after you've done all your upfront work, it's an easy fit, and they're almost ecstatic to have you because you've done all the work for them. Well, we talked about why people need a, a manifesto and the difference it can make. Let's talk about the what and the how, Maggie. What What does a manifesto look like? Is this a, a one-page document? Is it 10 pages? And how, how do you structure it? Well, I like to structure you know, it, the elements of one's ideal career, which is really what that manifesto is all about, um, into different sections, right? Uh, and I call it a career guide, right? So everybody out there who wants a manifesto really needs this kind of guide. And it includes two parts, Mac. It's a checklist, right? Which are literally the, uh, the you know, the types of skills you want to utilize, your unique gifts and talents, the ways you want to make a difference, the ways you want to be creative, you know, even the, the, the ways you like to work, like I said, you want to commute, you want to not commute. How much do you want to make? You know, everything's from the lofty to the practical in bulleted, prioritized points. And you want to have that vision, which is that day in the life written out in paragraph form when you've achieved, right, your ideal scenario. So it's almost projecting yourself out into the future to say, okay, these are the elements of what I'd really love to have. This is my manifesto and how I want to make a difference and how I want to be of service. And, and, and the ways that role has to work for me, too, and give back to me, now here's what it sounds like, right? So it's, it's 6 a.m. and I'm getting up and I'm having breakfast in this way and I, and I get to work this way or that way, whether I'm walking or driving. Like You get into detail. And I mean a 500-foot level of detail you know, about what you really want and what that looks and feels like. Really, So that career guide, that manifesto is a two-part process of bulleted points, of specific things you want, as well as this paragraph written out day in the life. Because think about it. When you talk to somebody about career, whether you're going for a job or just having casual cocktail party conversation, you know, it's, it's really more useful if you can get into detail for people. Because Mac, if you said to me, Maggie, I like it, you know, I'd love to have a job that where I'm able to help others. And I say, yeah, me too, Mac. I love helping others. We might be talking about two completely different things. Right. I mean, in this case, I think we're talking about the same thing because mm -hmm. <laughs> you and I are quite aligned. 
But oftentimes we stop at too high a level of detail and we just assume we know what the other person's talking about. Your manifesto helps you really paint this picture for yourself and others so that it's easier to craft the reality, right? The manifesto doesn't just stay as a paragraph or on a piece of paper or on your computer. It becomes your real experience. And that's the power. I've had so many clients who tell me, Maggie, I can't believe this, but I just found a job description that matches what's in my manifesto word for word. Like it really has bullet points that match what they say they want. And they're often surprised, but I'm not because this is how manifestos work. We're actually crafting and creating our experiences and our career opportunities you know, this is just another way people are doing that. So have a vision, lay out in bullet form what a typical day looks like, what responsibilities uh, might include. And, and once you have the – let's talk, Maggie, about how you would create a document like that. What, what does the process look like? Is this something you do by yourself? Do you work with peers? Uh, do you use checklists? What, what have you seen work successfully for people? Sure. Well, I I tend to find that a lot of people have a challenge reacting to a blank piece of paper, even though they might have ideas. It's just daunting, right? And and also, a lot of times people think, oh, well, why should I even write that down? It's probably not possible, right? So they have these mental blocks, too. So rather than just starting with a blank piece of paper, what I recommend people do is start with a series of exercises, whether that's something, you know, in in my Soul Search workbook or something in a What Colors Your Parachute. You know, there are really great, insightful exercises out there that can get you to details about what you want versus what you don't. And like I said, those areas that you want to look at, there's actually nine different areas that I help my clients look at from what they love to do, not just what they like or what they can stand, right. <laughs> but what they love to do, their unique gifts and talents, the skills they want to utilize, not just the skills they could utilize, but the ones they actually want to utilize, um, as well as, like I said, how they want to make a difference, how they want to be creative. Um, even something called work preferences that includes, do they want to work for a big company, small company, or their own company, right? Everybody's got their own definition. And, and just by way of example, I used to say to people, well, I want to be in business. That's what I want. And when I said that, I, all, I got all this great um, advice to go into accounting because accounting's in business and there's a lot of opportunity. Well, what I really meant now that I know this 20 years later out of school is that you know, what I meant to say was, I want to be my own boss. I want to have my own business. And so when you have a manifesto, do you hear that in my voice? It's a, it's a desire. It's a, a point of view, right? It's, and I could tell you, I would say, I want to be my own boss because I enjoy the lifestyle of it. I know I'm my own best boss and that that's how I like to work because I work best on my own, et cetera. I can expand on that, which is what a manifesto helps you do is get clear on your perspective for what type of career you really want and then expound upon that so that other people understand what you mean. So for me, saying I want to be in business got me a great CPA, (laughs) an accounting degree, but not one I want to use in quite that same way. So once you have your manifesto written, how how should you use it in a job search and and throughout your career, Maggie? Should you share it with recruiters? uh, Share with as many people as possible, Mac. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people look at me like, really, I can tell people about this uh, because so often their own, they think it's a wild, crazy idea. And I'll say, you're not crazy. You're on to something, right? Your manifesto might be very different than your current career reality, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't share it because what's interesting, and here's the magic that happens, you know, so for example, part of my manifesto, Mac, was to have a radio talk show, right? I love listening to talk radio. I just, you know, secretly in my own mind, just oh, imagine myself in front of that microphone, right? But I never really expressed it as a career goal. But I'll tell you, it's always been part of my manifesto, right? And so when I joined, the, I took the job at Martha Stewart. It was actually a training job. I was in charge of training and development as their director. And wouldn't you know it, Martha Stewart starts a Sirius XM channel. And they're looking for show content. And I had already been career coaching within the company. So people knew, I knew what I was talking about. And I said, we should have a career show. And they said, do you want to host it? And so when you say, how do you make this manifesto reality? How do you use it in your career? How do you make it part of your path? You've got to start sharing it. Because at that moment, when she launched that station, it was my opportunity to, to raise my hand and say, wow, I've always wanted a show. Here's the idea I have. What do you think? And Uh, No one had any clue Martha Stewart was going to do that, but that's how the magic happens. You follow your path, you share what you're looking to create, and it finds a way to you, and and most often ways you never imagined. 
And it's a really positive magnetic effect, which I think we talk about in things like The Secret, but you've got to be the catalyst. And that's what that manifesto helps you do is be the person who's sharing the perspective out there, who's putting that, planting that seed almost with other people about, hey, you know, with me, it was always about career. I love career conversations. I just thought everybody talked about careers in cocktail conversation, but no, it's just me. (laughs) And the minute you start to realize that you're unique and that your genius is valuable and that you, it's time to package it and put your perspective out there. That's where your manifesto really starts to hit the ground running for people because they see ways to put you into service. Well, I just love your, your main point, which is uh, be, tell people what you want and be clear about what you want. And any process that helps people accomplish that, I think is going to help them have great success in, in a job search and throughout their career. Well, Maggie, this has been a great conversation. Now, tell us what's next for you. Well, Mac, you know, for me, it's always about encouraging people to, what's the word, elevate their expectations and to be excited, uh, you know, about their opportunities and work. We've had a lot of challenges uh, from a uh, career economic standpoint. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people are just being, you know, it's great to have an income, yes, and it's great to have a job but it's time to raise our expectations. So for me, what I've been doing are quarterly get-togethers in cities like New York, Boston, I'm looking at Philadelphia and Miami, and I'm really looking to get out there with people to get folks together because when we get the camaraderie of other folks who are also creating their manifestos, following them, planting those seeds, it's really energizing. So if people are feeling you know, that maybe this isn't possible for them. I encourage them to check out my website and see if there's an event coming soon to them or even suggest one and contact me because we're all in this together and we all want to make a great living. Well, I know people can find you online at your website, which is maggiemistel.com and we'll be sure to include a link uh, to your website and a blog post as well. You've written about career manifestos and for folks who haven't received the, the show notes, uh, Maggie Mistel is M A G G I E M I S T A L dot com. Maggie, thanks for being on the show today. My pleasure, Mac, and thank you for the work you're doing to encourage and support people because at the end of the day, anything truly really is possible. And the more that people see that in their own lives, the better off we'll all be. Well, that's kind of you. Take care, Maggie. Thanks, Mac. We're back in the Max List studio with my co-host. So, Becky, Jessica, Ben, what were some key points you heard Maggie make? Well, I really liked this interview um, for a couple reasons. Yeah, it was Uh, great. The first, you know, we, in our conversation at the beginning of the show, we were all kind of framing manifesto as a commitment device, like forcing yourself to to do something that you've decided upon. And I think Maggie's approach is completely different. It's not about commitment as much as it was about clarity, Mm -hmm. like really getting clear about what you want. Um, And even to the extent that that you're sharing this manifesto with others, it's not to make yourself more accountable to people, which I think is a plus. But her emphasis really on like, Telling, showing people what you really want to be doing so that they're able to help you in more constructive ways. I thought yeah. that was brilliant. I loved it as well. Same thing of, you know, the detailing how to get really, really clear. We, we say that all the time of get clear about your goals to be able to, to land the career that you want. But I think that she really detailed ex- specifically how to do that and um, some good suggestions for, um, you know, thought processes for how to get there in terms of, um, you know, what does your day look like? Where are your energy points? And all of those types of things, like really, really, really think about that. And it's not just, you know, I want to work in accounting at a business downtown. Like, what do you want to do at the, like which firm specifically, where downtown, what time do you want to start working? Like what type of, uh, cur- what type of services are, is that firm going to help other people do like extremely clear and really gran- granular. And I did, um, like Ben said, I really thought that that was really helpful for when you, cause everybody, when you're looking for jobs, like we talked about before, everyone asks you, well, what kind of job are you looking for? And if you are able to give them a very, very specific, I want to work at XYZ 
company doing X, Y, Z, that's going to be super helpful and people can put you in touch with people that are going to help you get there or directly help you get there. So I think that, yeah, I loved it. It was great. Becky, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with what you guys are saying. Um, I think the other thing that really resonated with me was the sort of the value of of really expressing what you want to be doing and putting it out there mm-hmm. and like sharing it with people mm-hmm. and not sort of like hiding your light under your bushel basket or whatever, but like mm-hmm. really, you know, being upfront about where mm-hmm. you want to go and like what your dreams might be. And so like, you know, that in itself starts to manifest in yeah. your life. Um, and I think that's really great, really exciting. Um, manifest your manifesto. Ooh. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Maggie should use that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, and also just the 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 fact that so many people sort of fall into jobs that they might not mm-hmm. like and Yeah, I liked um, what when she said that. Really focusing and, and and it is a commitment in a way where you're like, I'm I wanna do this. I I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna, you know, compromise in my career. Um, it's like a mission statement that organizations create yeah. to help guide them for what they what kind of services they're going to provide or what kind of um, partnerships to pursue and those mm-hmm. types of things yeah. it's a really good like you were saying a really good way to like guide your choices help you guide yeah. your choices it's like a, um, a backbone mm-hmm. to be able to say like here is what my goals and values are and whenever I'm at a crossroads and I'm not sure if this is in alignment, I can I have this document, I have this manifesto, I have yeah. this declaration mm-hmm. saying exactly what it is, and I can revisit that and you know have or have these check boxes or you know bullet points or whatever that she was mentioning. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's really good. The only thing that I sort of think about is like y- there's never going to be the perfect opportunity, right? Like. I think people shouldn't get too focused Mm -hmm. on like making sure that every opportunity fits every single goal that they want to achieve. So I think like you you're you're gonna have to compromise and like keep that in mind. But it's still important to sort of like know yourself and have your priorities out there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, using it as a guide and something that is going to move you towards what you want, knowing that you know you're not. It's it's if it's a wish list. You're not going to get all of the yeah, all of the everything. wishes granted, mm-hmm. but you can you can sort of get as as close as possible and make sure that whatever opportunity is presented to you or mm-hmm. that you encounter is as close to your your dream or your um, core values and and skills as yeah, possible. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed. And to your point, Becky, about telling people where you want to go. I also, which I thought was um, spot on by Maggie, I also liked her emphasis on, on aiming high. Not, mm-hmm. And we're not going to get achieve every goal we might set for ourselves, but we shouldn't be, we shouldn't start by settling for a second or third best. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you, if you aim high, doors will open uh, and you'll, it'll take you to the places you want to go. Yeah. And if you don't, gosh, you'll, you'll never get there. Right. So, that's true. Well, great conversation, and uh, I enjoyed that interview with Maggie very much. Well, thank you all, and thank you, our listeners, for joining us for today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. If you like what you hear, uh, please sign up for our free weekly newsletter. In every issue, we give the key points of that week's show. We also include links to all the resources mentioned, and you get a transcript of the full episode. If you subscribe now, we'll send you our new guide, The Top Career Podcasts of 2017. Discover all the shows that can help you get a job and get the career you want. Get your free newsletter and, and podcast guide today. Go to maxlist.org slash topcareerpodcast2017. And join us next Wednesday when our special guest will be Titus Blair. He'll explain how to write a 21st century resume. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.